Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Corcoran, Vice President of Education at the New York Botanical Garden. It is a delight to welcome you to the 21st Annual Winter Lecture Series with our two guests from California, garden designer Leslie Bennett and moderator Jennifer Jewell, host of Cultivating Place. Reflecting on this past year with its many challenges, we feel so grateful to you, our community of gardeners, designers, and plants people in the audience today, I send out a warm welcome to our new friends from across the country and around the world. Your support at this time means so much to the garden and to our education program. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to participate in today's event. Our education manager, Jason Griffith, is facilitating things behind the scenes. If you wanna make a comment during the presentation, use the chat button. And if you'd like to ask Leslie or Jennifer a question directly, please use the Q&A feature. Also, if you see an interesting question pop up in the Q&A, you can like it. Liked questions automatically flip to the top of the list and will be asked first. So, you know, just around this time last year, we were eagerly anticipating a talk with Jennifer Jewell and the great author, gardener, Jamaica Kincaid. Jennifer had just published The Earth in Her Hands, that wonderful book profiling 75 women in the plant world. And NYBG was going to celebrate Women's History Month on March 13th with these two extraordinary women, plus many others from Jennifer's book, like Margaret Roach, Frances Palmer, and Marta McDowell, all who planned to join us on that day. So you can guess the rest of the story, right? Jennifer and Jamaica already were in town from California and Boston when Governor Cuomo basically closed down the city and we had no choice but to cancel our event in Ross Lecture Hall. Except we didn't give up entirely. That Friday morning, as the garden was rushing to batten down the hatches, we ushered Jamaica and Jennifer into the conservatory and recorded their conversation in a quiet corner of the, cor of the conservatory. Outside, it was bedlam, but inside the empty grand glass house surrounded by orchids, time was suspended and it was truly magical. Several months later and deeper into the pandemic, I called Jennifer to ask if she might put me in touch with Leslie Bennett whom I first encountered as one of the remarkable women in Jennifer's book. We had landed on this series theme by then, Gardens of Meaning, it felt very resident. And I was moved by Leslie's Black Sanctuary Gardens project, which creates beautiful spaces of refuge in collaboration with Black women and communities. You know, it's such a timely topic. And we soon realized it was a perfect subject for another in-depth conversation with Jennifer, who is such a skilled moderator. So we've come full circle, and I can guarantee you that you are in for a very special treat. It is now my great pleasure to bring up Jennifer Jewell, who will introduce Leslie Bennett. Bennett. Thank you so much, Barbara. It is such a treat to be back here again and to hear you walk us through this last year and the beginning of it, as you say, on that day, uh, that fateful Friday, the 13th of March, 2020, uh, takes me right back. So thank you very much for uh, inviting me to moderate with Leslie Bennett. Of course, Jennifer. So I'm going to hand over the virtual stage to you now. I will unmute, I will mute myself and stop my video. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And it's, again, such, such an honor to be here um, and uh, to introduce to you Leslie Bennett, who, as Barbara just referenced, is the owner, founder, and creative director of Pine House Edible Gardens. She is also the founder of the Black Sanctuary Gardens, and both are based out of Oakland, California. Leslie is a former attorney, and she, while working in law, was focused on land use. She graduated from Harvard in environmental science with a focus on how environmental science intersects with social justice. She went on to receive her law degree from Columbia University, followed by a master's in law from the University College of London, where she focused on issues of cultural property and landscape preservation. 
After practicing law for some time, Leslie realized that law was not her true calling, but that working with the land and landscapes was. And since making that sort of, or having that realization, um, she made the bold move to move from law to founding her own design build business. And she has dedicated herself to bringing the complex issues that compelled her in school and in subsequent training and in the focus of her law, legal work to the garden with her. As you can see, there are some themes here. The first being that Leslie is pretty brilliant. And the second being that much of her life, she has dedicated that brilliance towards the benefit of both land and people. I first met Leslie at a horticultural summit in Seattle, Washington in 2017. And we'd been interacting with one another on social media for some time. And I knew that I wanted to speak with her about some of these more challenging garden conversations on my public radio program and podcast, Cultivating Place. And when I was asked by Timber Press in late 2017 to write a book about extraordinary women working in the world of plants, Leslie Bennett had to be one of those women. And again, when I was invited by photographer Caitlin Atkinson uh, to be the writer on a book about visionary gardens and gardeners in the West at this time. I was proud to be able to write about the work of Leslie Bennett and gardens of her design in relationship with their places and the people who inhabit them. Leslie's conceptualization and creation of generous gardens of both meaning and sanctuary on multiple layers have take home lessons for all of us at a time at a time when our world is in great need of both meaning and sanctuary. And with that, I am just so pleased to welcome Leslie Bennett. I'm going to stop sharing for a second so we can welcome Leslie. Leslie, hey. it's so nice to see you. Hi, Jennifer. It's so great to be here. And um, thanks to the New York Botanic Garden for having me, both of us. And thanks so much for um, supporting and, and participating in this uh, with me. I re really appreciate it. The, uh, it's, it's great to be two California women visiting New York, right? In the <laughs> yes. middle of winter, right? Oh, yeah. Virtually. <laughs> Yes, virtually. <laughs> virtually. So uh, I'm going to return to sharing my screen uh, because we have some great images uh, to share with you today. And um, I want to start, Leslie, by having you walk us through the mission of Pine House Edible Gardens, especially the name of your landscape uh, design build company. And especially in the wake of 2020. Like, tell us the mission and, and what it all stands for. And then we'll walk through um, some of the gardens that bring this mission to life. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, and I think you and I have um, really talked about this. Uh, it's, I, I love that I get to talk about it with you since mm -hmm. I think we sort of um, uh, witnessed and uh, in many ways supported the um, evolution of my work. Um, so it feels great to get to review some of that with you. And um, yeah, I have been running Pine House Edible Gardens um, here in Oakland, California for, this is now my 11th year, um, which is pretty wild. Um, yeah. And, you know, at, at our foundation, um, we are, uh, we're a design, build and maintenance um, service. And we work all around the Bay Area creating um, creating beautiful edible gardens. And I feel like that sort of um, meeting point um, of uh, combining beauty and production um, was a really big integration point for me when I started 10 years ago, um, because at that time there was sort of a big organic food uh, and farming movement, and then there were gardens. And there wasn't a lot, um, I always have to give credit to Rosalind Creasy for, um, for sort of being a foundational person in that space, but there wasn't a lot of connection between um, food and beauty and home spaces. 
And so um, that was really a big journey for me was to just figure out how to do it. I started out on farms. I learned how to grow. I, I started out really knowing very little. I was, I was a lawyer, um, but I was really seeking that connection and really spent a lot of time um, trying to learn how to how to integrate beauty and food production into spaces. Um, and I've been lucky to get to do that really just uh, actively through my work um, and a lot of it by trial and error because there, there was not a textbook, right. <laughs> there was not a teacher. Um, and to get to do that over the last 10 years. And I think, um, so there's that, that whole layer of what, what we have always done. And um, over the years, I started to really sort of my, my purpose in getting involved with the work was to try to, um, was really coming at it from an environmentalist lens. And you mentioned that was, that was my background, um, my academic background. Um, and it really, it comes down to trying to help my clients and the people I work with to connect with the land that they live with. And I felt like, wow, food is a great way to help people to understand um, you know, we literally are what we eat, the plants are what they eat, and we are so directly connected to the actual land we live with, which is such a, um, such a missing part of, I think, our, our modern lives. Um, and then adding in the layer of beauty and sort of remo removing the utilitarian aspect yeah. and bringing in beauty, um, which I think we all inherently value, um, brings another layer. Um, and then as I was doing the work, I realized, wow, like what's really motivating me here is, is the people at the center of each of these gardens. Um, and each of these people brings their own story. Um, and that story can be um, family stories. It can be the, their memory of growing up and what their grandmother grew in their garden. It can be a memory that they um, don't even hold, but like know might be there. Um, those can be cultural um, traditions. Um, or um, rituals that are passed down through the family um, right. or, that they, or that have not been passed down and that want to be reactivated. And so I found this whole other layer of cultural, a cultural landscape um, that I've, <clears throat> again, through trial and error, just uh, tried to integrate into the gardens that we design and, and build, um, making sure that that fragrant lilac that somebody remembers from their childhood uh, in, the, in the Southeast and not in California, <laughs> Um, you know, making, trying to make that work here because it matters, because it's a memory. Yeah. Um, and, you know, with a client who's really is perhaps seeking a, um, a, a vegetable that grows in Southeast Asia and does not grow here, making a space for that, just so there is an actual space for that connection. Right. Um, so that's sort of the foundation of the work. And yeah. then um, I think in doing that over the last 10 years, alongside uh that's sort of on the surface like what we do and then um i think there's been a um how to say this i or i guess i say um run, running my business has been a, the other huge part and like really when we're creating gardens there's there's people involved to make them and i think creating a business that is uh woman-centered that is diverse that is safe for people who are traditionally marginalized. And I'm one of them in every other work environment I've had, they've been white dominant spaces um, that are super hierarchical and male dominated as well. And they have not felt safe for me. And so it's been a really huge um, part of my work at Pine House to, as we're creating these gardens, to be also creating a business that is um, yeah. safe and feels good for my team. Yeah. Um, and I guess the, the third thing, I'm sorry, this is probably a much longer answer than you thought no, you were going to No, this is great. This is great. <laughs> um, yeah. As you said, there are many layers, um, but that is, that is intersectional living here. Um, yep. Yeah, and I think along, uh, alongside all of that, I've, um, I think I started out, you know, I remember when I first went to, to an organic farm in Northern California and sort of said, hey, I, I want to learn how to grow food. I want to get real. Um, you know, I also encountered whiteness. I encountered intense whiteness uh, in the organic farming um, space that was, um, you know, really uncomfortable. And um, that was a discomfort that I was really accustomed to. Um, and also that I did not, uh, <laughs> did not want. <laughs> and so I think I've been sitting with that sort of 
discerning it um, and, and then moving into sort of garden design, you know, as I've gotten better at my work, my business has looked more and more like a high-end landscape business. And again, there, high-end landscape designed, um, just running a business, <laughs> operating within capitalism, there's a lot of whiteness. And um, I have had an increasing level of um, discomfort with that. And then real, I think I really, I feel like I've spent the last 10 years just trying to figure out, okay, how do I, <clears throat> How do I integrate my um, my passion, my creative passion, which truly yeah. is creating these gardens and learning about plants and centering people? Um, how do I integrate that with um, my passion and belief in racial justice? Um, and what I'm like really encountering here, which is that landscape design, as we currently know it in the United States, really does center whiteness. Um, and my own business was, was looking like that because um, those are the people that could afford my services. That's a simplified version of it and because yeah. of all the structural reasons um, that make that look like that. So, um, so anyways, over time, I've just really worked towards centering um, something else and uh, that um, something else has come to be the Black Sanctuary Gardens um, project. Um, I started about two years ago, um, sort of just on the side. I, I wasn't even confident enough in myself or I think the concept, um, but I was like, wait, you know, I don't, I'm not serving enough black women. This is a problem. It's the same as when you walk into, when I walk into any room, if there's not people of color there, like it's a problem. Um, and I saw that I could discern that problem in my work. Um, and so I was, I was creating gardens sort of on the side, sort of like I guess even like a friends and family discount, like it was just trying to make it work, trying right. to be able to make my my services meet a wider, wider range of people. Um, and uh, I named that project, the Black Sanctuary Gardens. And really last year to get to your, your final part of your question about sort of my mission post 2020 is that I realized that truly my authentic um, self is to create these gardens and to um, and to center black women and to center people of color within the American landscape. Um, and I have um, spent the last year integrating that into my business so that now um, we have a regular program of creating gardens for black women with and without financial support. It's not really a it's not really a financial program. It's a it's a um, it's a <laughs> political program. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, it's a justice and like humanity yeah. program. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And I've, I've really integrated it very, um, I think 2020 gave me the space to, and I, I felt it gave me the space and I felt so compelled. I think um, what COVID showed our country and really brought to the surface was just how landscape design in the Bay Area has been really inequitable for a very long time. Yeah. And um, pretty, um, pretty, pretty shockingly so. Um, I think last year really brought it to the surface and let us see, okay, wow, like this is, um, this is really intense. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't not be loud about it. I, I knew my truth. I knew that my truth was that, um, that black women are my personal priority. And I, um, felt compelled and had the space to build that into my business. I hired a business coach. I, uh, with support, and I think I named that because I think these are, it's so hard to swim upstream in this society. Yep. Um, I got the support that I needed to um, really clearly articulate that, um, that Black women are at the center of the work that we do. And no matter um, who we are designing for, um, we design and love designing and creating gardens for a full range of human beings, um, but it is all in service of Black women um, who are my and Pine House's priority. Um, and that feels really, um, that feels really great to have arrived at that place where I, yeah. um, where I know that and I can say it and I can actually uh, put structure and dollars behind it. Yeah. So uh, I hope some of that was clear. That was a oh, lot. Oh no, that's great. <laughs> that's more. great. No, it's, um, it's wonderful. And that 
there's like this beautiful trifecta of everything you have done in your life leading you up to this point where you see uh, environmental science, land use, and social justice and equity all confluence in this just powerful and very embodied way, um, which I know is kind of a, a trendy word right now, but to see a garden come full circle with these ethics and um, priorities at their center is you see, we can see the transformation. So with that, I'm going to move us into, you know, what does some of this mean? What does it actually look like in a garden and, um, and have us uh, go through that? Um, and we will get more into all of these things, what a cultural landscape is, what, um, you know, what she, Leslie is talking about and bringing to life with um, equity, structure in her her business as well as uh the blank the black sanctuary gardens in its current uh state right now the so i'm gonna take us to our next garden leslie and uh have you walk us through where this is who the gardeners are who live here and what it is they wanted um that they asked for your particular expertise and passion to be uh, their partners on creating this landscape of both beauty and productivity and meaning and sanctuary. Great, yeah. Um, yeah, I love starting with this. Um, this is one of the a garden that I, one of the earlier gardens that I worked on. Um, and um, the garden is for Ron and Miwa. They're, um, they're a couple that live in um, Los Altos, California. It's a front yard, uh, productive edible landscape. Uh, and it is, it is it, it's, there's a lot of cultural layers in here. And um, it was really the first time I'd had the opportunity to really actively um, try to make, make a space like this happen. Um, so Ron is Chinese American and had grew up in Grass Valley up in the, um, uh, that up in the Grass Valley area of um, the Sierra foothills. Yeah. Uh, and his wife, Miwa, is from Japan, born and raised in Japan, and um, they're both based here now. And um, so they they have this beautiful concept. Um, they brought it to me. Um, they wanted their front yard to represent the Occidental West. The, uh, the backyard was the East. It's actually a traditional um, Japanese garden. And um, then the side yard areas of their house were these sort of connecting zones um, where we ended up situating a a traditional sort of, not traditional, it's actually a really cool modern uh, vegetable garden and another sort of contemplative space. Um, but the front yard was this, um, was Ron's and uh, he wanted it to be super low water, like conservation oriented, um, a lot around water sufficiency, which is very much connected to the land and California and how, how we are. So it felt very land based and land appropriate. He really wanted it to um, reference the plants that he, truly loves um, that he remembered rambling amongst when he grew up as a child in the Sierra foothills. So right. the manzanitas, the California poppies. Um, and then he wanted food. He, he said, this is gonna be food producing and I, there's specific um, foods that he wanted to grow. Some of which um, were, many of which were very relevant to Japanese and Chinese American cuisines, and then some of which um, were not. Um, so a wide range. Um, and so this this picture, so anyway, so we integrated it, we did it. Um, and it was super fun to work on. And I, I love the visual effect. Um, and this picture is great. It shows um, the California poppies with those bright orange flowers. Yeah. The manzanita is kind of hiding over there to the right. Those are both California native plants. Um, then we've got a big gray pineapple guava, which is a fruiting, um, a fruiting um, low water perennial plant. Um, and we've got edible bamboo shoots, um, which the couple does harvest and, and cook, um, used to eat. Um, not pictured, or maybe in the next picture. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch more. There's rhubarb, there's um, so actually three different varieties of edible bamboo. Um, here we've got, a, I love this shot too. Um, this is that side yard contemplative area and we used Japanese maple, which he loved, um, a beautiful chiflora in the background. And then that really pretty little um, ginger type plant at the bottom is indeed a ginger. It's a Miyoga ginger, 
which is a um, Japanese native cold hardy ginger, um, which I think one of the highlights of my uh, gardening career was when Ron and Miwa invited me. I, I had no idea what it was, um, but loved the opportunity to learn, learn about it and grow it. And when they invited me over and um, they made this really delicious Japanese soup um, and I got to taste, you know, what the Miyaga ginger tastes like and, and how it's used. Right. Um, so I think that, yeah, and, and I think there's maybe another shot too. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, and this is a Fuyu persimmon um, with another edible, um, that's the Mexican weeping bamboo, which is an edible bamboo. Um, and there's more, there's figs, there's passion fruit, there's um, Zauschneria, the California native, there's rosemary, there's um, tons of pineapple guava, there's loquat, actually the loquat was in that first shot. Um, there's a lot of fruit and um, native habitat and, oh, and storytelling, like the garden also includes um, a red, a flowering red plum, and that's specifically um, to cut and um, use the flowers to celebrate the Lunar New Year. Um, and so there's so many layers of, um, of story and native land, like actual, the land, uh, sort of land, land-based uh, references there. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, they're, they're also super into hot, into modern design. Um, I think these pictures show like there's a highly stylized um, yeah. curated space. We focus so much on, yeah. and you can see that beautiful um, house, um, yeah. but we really focused on foliage, um, textures, colors, um, creating really strong rhythms. Um, so it is a super visually, in, uh, visually curated space um, yeah. that also delivers on all these other fronts. And I think to go back to my original point, um, this is a space where Ron's an active gardener. We support him, but he is out there. Um, Miwa's, Miwa, Miwa's not out there. She's not a gardener, but she loves to cook. Um, she is dehydrating those persimmons. <laughs> She's doing the things. Yep. And, um, and it, it is a place where they are connected. And I think in this little suburban cul-de-sac in Los Altos where you could just be another modern tech worker divorced from the land and yep. uh, divorced from our sort of cultural narratives. Um, this garden serves as a space for them to really be connected to who they are, where they're from, um, and where they're going. Yeah, and where they are too. So this is <laughs> one of the gardens that Leslie shared with me. Um, and all of this beautiful photography you're seeing is by Caitlin Atkinson um, so far. There are a couple of other photo credits that I will yeah. get to as we move along. but. Um, you and know, you it, talked with them. I, I forgot you. You've had yeah. extensive interviews with Ron. Like, yeah. you know, it's it's pretty and amazing. It's really amazing. And so, what you can't see uh, is what Leslie just referenced, which is this is a very, you know, kind of urban suburban cul-de-sac with green watered lawns in Northern California. Um, otherwise, you know, all of the other gardens are these green watered lawns in the front, except for Ron and Miwa's and these, this sort of proliferation of plants that they eat, but that also bring in insects and birds mm -hmm. has really, um, I think, lit Ron up for how to pull in more beneficial insects, how to pull in predators to dissuade the non-beneficial insects, to have a healthy balance. And I think that you know, Leslie, one of the genius aspects of your work in this way is that that idea of balance, which brings in food and beauty, and then that cultural layer makes this garden so much more than just a, a thing, a, a, an ornament. It is a, it is this narrative, both personal and practical and spiritual. And, and that is what happens when you elevate what you want from a garden, how you think about a garden. Um, and that is certainly what you are doing. And you are educating not only and, and elevating up the people who work with you on these gardens, but also the people whose gardens these are to again, raise their expectation of what a garden can be and do in our world. Um, take us to your next garden, Leslie. Great, I will. Well, and I'll just add on that. Yeah, and thank you. I'm, I'm so glad, I, again, I'm, I love that I get to talk with you about this because I feel like we both um, 
uh, have seen these spaces and have some uh, great perspectives to bring on it. But uh, one more thing on, on that garden is that I love that now Ron, and I think it is on a spiritual level and that's sort of, you know, truly I think where this, that's where this, I guess I forgot in my, in, in my introduction, I, I got really clear and stated in my sort of mission statement that, you know, I think gardens are spaces of transformation yeah. for ourselves and for our societies. Yeah. And so once we realize that, we realize this is super powerful work or yeah. can be if we infuse it with all this intentionality, if we ground it in our histories and our ancestral connections, um, and if we keep it inspired with beauty and that we need to sort of keep heart through all of this. Um, and so I think with Ron, I just love the that he now we did all of this, we created it, and then you know we interact with it. He interacts with it, and then uh, in the last year or two, he's taken it to this whole new level. And he's he called me. He's like, I'm rewilding myself. He's like, right. we're gonna do weeds in this garden <laughs> and now we have like uh so thistle sow thistle however you say it so yeah thistle, we've got daikon weeds there's several others i can't remember i think there's five weeds that he's specifically cultivating harvesting the green yeah weeds and you know yep. i resisted that i was like don't mess up my garden i know <laughs> and then <laughs> And then, you know, I was like, oh, but you know, it's his garden, not mine. So, so I was like, okay, you know, let's, let's do this. And I, I love it. He's so passionate about it. And it's helped me to bring a layer. It, I mean, it's helped me to see another layer that's possible. Um, Cause I think we're all stretching and growing. And I, I mean, I think that's really important to say too. Um, <clears throat> I've done a lot of work um, sort of confronting whiteness in landscape design, um, centering blackness, centering black women. And it's a work in progress. I don't have it all figured out. Like I grew up in these same white supremacist infested waters <laughs> that we all live in. And, um, you know, so garden design, I think is a, in many ways, a practice of decolonization. And, you know, I'm in it too. I mean, look at this, this next image um, could be a portrait of colonization um, or it's a portrait, of, you know, this right. is a traditional estate garden and that's what we're working with. Um, uh, and this is for another amazing client um, I've worked with for 10 years now. Um, and it's really interesting to like, I think, hold those tensions. Like what, what are we doing? Like, what are the things that are happening here? And I think we are, they're looking at the space. I personally see so many things. And so I'll walk you through a few of them. Um, so this garden, this um, client is um, uh, it's of Italian ancestry. Um, her family came here as immigrants from Italy, maybe her grandparents did, and they ran a, um, a, a winery up in uh, Northern California in the Ukiah area. So um, our client, she does, she loves, Denise, she, she loves growing food. Um, she's a huge cook um, and she's, she loves her garden. Um, and she came to us also like really clear that these are some things, what she wanted to do in her garden was very much related to her family history and like, that sense of self. Um, you can't see it, unfortunately, in the shot, but right behind that big olive tree is this, um, and it's really like the centerpiece of the garden, aside from the fountain, which is also an Italian sandstone fountain. Um, but right behind that olive tree is um, a really huge old um, grape press, and it's, um, it is from her grandparents' land, where she spent her summers growing up, running through the fields, probably stomping on grapes, like who knows what. Um, and this huge grape press is the centerpiece of that, that space, which is actually, actually you can see it. To the right of the olive, there's a bunch of big green leaves. Those are um, a squash, a big squash plant. Here. Um, this shot was taken to the right, the right of the olive. There. Right there, yeah. And so that those, uh, we actually use the grape press as a support for, um, for pumpkins and squash. <laughs> Actually, the pumpkins, her grand, she grows pumpkins for her grandson, uh, grandchildren now. Um, and so, I mean, that right there, I might even, I could even just stop there. Like it is, it's her grandparents' great press transplanted to the front yard and she is looking at it and using it to create memories for her grandchildren. And to me, like, that's what I want to create space for in a garden is that transmission of family memories and identity. Um, it's also her front yard and it's in a, a neighborhood where your yard needs to look a certain way. So we're in this space, we're integrating a lot of things. Um, again, it's highly stylized. You've got a lot of evergreen elements and colors and rhythms so that this space looks really good throughout all the seasons. Um, it also includes a ton of food. 
Um, I'll just point out a few. You've got potted Meyer lemons, um, and again, like these uh, classic Italian terracotta pots. There's uh, three uh, apricots on the far right. There's actually a stretch of six Fuyu persimmons on the on even further to the right out of screen. There's pineapple guavas again. There's lavender, which she uses for baking. There's rosemary just to the left of that lavender. There's the squash. There's three avocado trees that are used as screening. Um, and that's sort of the kind of thing that I think it's a good example of sort of what there, there's a ton of bloom. She does a lot of cutting and bringing flowers inside. Um, and then the rest of the landscape includes pomegranates and figs and a vegetable garden and um, cardoons, um, being able to grow cardoons and do create her the recipes her mother had taught her was super important in this garden. And, you know, I think that's just an example of using the cardoon is an amazing plant to get to design with. It's so beautiful. It's that huge silver broad architectural leaf. Um, and so getting to use that um, as a backdrop for um, for other plantings has just been really fun. So I think I think that's probably it with this picture. But um, yeah, I think I want to keep us moving because I do not right. want to run out of space at the end. And Perfect. you know, one of the things I I think that I really love in most in in many of these stories is the making all of these layers visible in those front garden spaces that you aren't hiding the utilitarian or the labor rich food portions of our garden in the back as though they are less than, um, mm -hmm. but it's reintegrating all of these reasons that we garden and that different people garden so that they get to come back together as opposed to be isolated from, from one another. And there's some really cultural importance to that reintegration. Um, and that kind of, you know, as you say, decolonization, which we are really finding um, space for and permission for in this time, which is one of the beautiful upsides. So now we're gonna move into Leslie's own garden. And if you didn't have a chance to see it, Leslie and her home garden were featured in Martha Stewart Living in the January, February issue. And so these photos taken by the talented Rachel Weil uh, are courtesy of that uh, publication's feature. So you are a black woman. This is your sanctuary garden. You, you, it is recent that you finally got to, to move your talents and passion and vision into your own garden. Walk us through this and, and why it's important and the elements and story uh, that are all wrapped up here. Great, I will. And thank you for naming that about the, uh, the foods. Um, yeah, I do think that's a really big uh, thing. Just the American sort of landscape narrative has made food ugly or unappealing or not not acceptable. Um, and I think just for me, it's been such a journey of, you know, I, I decided I was gonna find the beauty in food. And it's been so great to get to, you know, say, hey, you know what, the pomegranate's gonna be the centerpiece of this. Like we're gonna build this landscape around this food and um, really find the beauty and, and find how to support the beauty. Um, because I think that's, what what we need to do like if you have a plant that's very changeable which a lot of food plants are then you find the supporting player that backs it up um, and that might be an evergreen ornamental or a habitat protector or a pollinator supporter um, but you find what works to make it work um, and I think that just that mindset is really um, has been transformational for me and I wanted to state that again here so anyways yeah so this is my yard uh, my backyard and uh, my family's my family in my backyard um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's super exciting for us. I was an apartment dweller for all my life till five years ago, or not all my life, like all my adult life. Um, and so my husband and I bought this, um, bought our house five years ago and he's a gardener, I'm a garden designer. We were, we were gonna have a garden. Um, and I, um, I think I was, this was, I had just completed the first black sanctuary garden and um, wanted to include myself in it, you know, realize that I um, not, not only did it just make sense, it also felt really important to, um, to be um, really a, a participant in the project and not to leave myself out. I think there's a lot of that, like yep. when we're trying to 
make change, like the, the whole self-care element. Like, um, you know, I think there's, uh, it felt really important to say, you know, it, like I'm actively including myself and taking care of myself as a black woman as I prioritize um, other black women alongside myself. So, um, so anyway, this is our backyard and the backyard really, um, we have two young children, age two and five. And um, I felt really strongly that um, one, I needed a space for myself to recharge and rest. It's not easy raising two young kids um, these, these days. Um, and I really wanted to be able to create a space that told the story for my children of who, who we are and who they are. Um, I want my parents, uh, my parents are immigrants um, from England and Jamaica. Um, I'm biracial, black and white. Um, and they really, um, they passed along a very strong cultural identity to me, which um, has been a great source of um, a great foundation for me in my life. And I felt, okay, I have this yard, you know, what am I going to do with it? And I think we all face that when we're looking at our spaces. Um, and I think what came to me is, okay, I want a place of beauty. I want to feel inspired. I want to be growing food because I want that connection and I want my kids to know where our food is coming from. Um, and then I want to tell the story of, of who we are. And so um, I want to include all these plants that are culturally relevant to us. Um, I want my kids to know, you know, when I grew up eating, uh, my dad used to make fever grass tea for us when we were feeling sick and also just on Sunday afternoon because he loved it. Um, fever grass is known here as lemongrass, um, but in Jamaica, it's, it's what you drink when you're sick. And, um, and so my garden includes um, fever grass and I want my children to know that they can grow their own medicine, make their medicine and be drinking it. Um, what we're looking at here is um, a simple dining area that's a guava tree that um, was actually existing in the garden. My neighborhood is full of guava trees. Um, and that, uh, my husband who's from Jamaica as well, that's his favorite fruit and that, that's his tree. Um, Right, and actually in the back shot here is this is our vegetable bed. Um, again, highly stylized because um, that's what makes me happy. Beautiful things make me happy. And then in that back shot, you'll see a peach. A peach is my favorite fruit. To me, that feels like um, California. That, that's, that is not Jamaican or English. That is my American self. Uh, <laughs> I grew up eating peach cobbler and I love it. So, um, so there's a range of things in here. Here we're looking at, um, there's a, a lemon just out of shot, a pomegranate, there's blueberries. Um, I planted an apple tree because that's my son's favorite fruit. A blueberry for my daughter, that's her favorite. Um, we've got passion fruit. Um, those are Jamaican. We've got um, roses. My mom loves roses and grew up in England where, where roses are important. Um, and you know, all of these, um, there's my daughter Zita no. um, enjoying her plum <laughs> garden. Those are the, those are the pluots or California fancy farmer's market um, pluot situation. But I feel like all these, all these elements, they really, um, they tell the story of who we are. And I, my kids are growing up knowing knowing what a guava is. There, there's a big banana There's not that's not um, shown here, but they are going to be, uh, I don't know, actually just, just recently we were, we were trimming the, the banana and the kids took the banana leaves and they built a fort out of the banana leaves. And mm -hmm. it was so sweet. My husband who grew up in, oh, there we go. My husband who grew up in, in Jamaica, you know, he looked at it, he said, wow, he's like, that's what we did. That's what we used to do in, in the rural village that he grew up in. And I just really love that my kids are getting this direct connection to, um, to the plants that have been important to their parents and that, that also go beyond our direct memories that our, our people, our ancestors, um, that's really a black diaspora story um, yeah. and a story of colonization, <laughs> um, yeah. which I don't know that we have time to get into. It, it now, so there. yeah, so we're we're there, um, and I'm watching our time very closely. Thank you. So Thank you. Um, we only have a few more minutes, but I really want you to to tell us because I think they're all woven together. Um, so I'd love you to share with people uh, the story of why your business is called Pine House Edible Gardens, and because it illustrates quite beautifully, I think, that 
tension you were discussing between um, or that lives inside this idea of cultural property and cultural landscapes. Please mm -hmm. tell that story and and uh, we might go just a tiny bit over uh, and but I'll get to a question and answers quite quickly after this. Yeah, no, I agree. This lands perfectly there. Um... So, and thank you for, for watching the time and getting us here. Um, yeah, no, I think I think that's exactly, I think my my own personal history, um, my company is called Pine House Edible Gardens and the, the choice for that name um, is, uh, it's actually always one that makes me a little bit uncomfortable to talk about. And I realized it's, and I named that because um, I think actually that discomfort is what we all need to get, I myself and all of us need to get more comfortable with sitting with. Um, the name Pine House Edible Gardens um, refer, refers to the, um, the I, I guess the horticultural meeting point, I would say between English and eight, one of the horticultural meeting points between um, the English and the Jamaicans, my, the people in my family history. Um, the a Pine House was a, an English Victorian creation. Um, there was a sort of like the Dutch and the tulips, there was a Victorian craze for pineapples, um, which in Jamaica are called pine, and um, and the Victorians built a series, you know, and all and just all sort of tropical and subtropical plants, and the Victorians built a series of um, conservatories, which are now really famous, places like Kew Gardens and uh, the Crystal Palace and all the other all the other amazing structures that are in uh, England. Um, but I think what they were, they were filled with plants that were brought back from warmer climates. Um, and I think it's really important to realize that those, those they brought back pineapples. Um, those pineapples were brought back on the same ships that carried slaves over um, from the African continent to the Caribbean and then circled back to bring um, plant species and money back to England. And um, that is literally what England is built on. That's literally what those buildings were built out of. Um, and so it's a very, um, it's a very painful and um, uncomfortable, for lack of a better word, um, an actual history that's there yeah. that we don't talk about very much. Um, and, I love the conservatory at Kew Gardens, like, and those buildings are beautiful. And so I think, you know, just in myself, being able to hold all of those things and to say, yeah. walk through that, that palm house at Kew Gardens and say, all these things are here at once. Yeah. And to sit with that discomfort, um, I don't, it is something that I think is really important to do. And that I, that I do do in my daily life, just being a black woman in this country with the heritage that I have and that I bring to my work. And so it does feel very, um, that's why I named the business that. And I, I guess I, I don't know that I actually had all that so clearly articulated when I chose the name, but as I've sat with it, I've been really thankful that I did choose that because I yeah. think that's my goal is to, is to hold all of those things and create out, create from that. And there is that gift of holding all of those things together visibly and consciously that that honesty of the reality of both rich exchange and, you know, enslavement and uh, erasure and appropriation, you know, that, that if we don't hold them all together and, and sort of surrender to that's where we were, then we can't go forward effectively. And, and that is what we're trying to do. Um, such a beautiful image and the, you know, that banana tree in your, in your garden as well, you know, encapsulates much of this story. So that's right. You know, this, this is where we are now. We are in, in a garden that uh, embraces and gives sanctuary to a, you know, five <laughs> and a half year old young black man, Samuel, and an adorable, these two are stealing the scene, Leslie. <laughs> um, and you are able to care for yourself and your family in order to strengthen your work on trying to care for both literally and metaphorically uh, the larger community of, um, of er, not eradicate, yeah, eradicating only whiteness in, in our garden world. 
And because that is to the benefit of all of us. And so, you know, Black Sanctuary Gardens is just this. Can you speak quite briefly? Because I, I have two minutes and we're going to get pulled yeah. off of the screen. <laughs> the, the importance of why Black women? Why not Black kids? Why not Black men? Why Black women? And, and give us uh, an idea of what kinds of fundraising goals you're going to do, how many gardens you have in progress, what your process is as, as quickly as you can, and then we will move to Q&A. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think um, I'm just going to say Black women because Black women, and I think there's um, there's lots, all of that can be Googled, um, but um, Black women because I, I choose to support them, and um, and I think um, I think we deserve it. And um, yeah, I, uh, let's see. I think uh, the main thing is we're we're creating uh, sanctuary spaces that um, that really. I think again, I want to create like a. I want to create actual space that feels safe, inspiring, nurturing. Um, I'm super inspired by Alice Walker's quote um, around in search of her mother's garden or our mother's garden, uh, naming the garden as black, a site for black women's creativity, spirituality, um, and something else, happiness. Um, and I just think that naming, we don't hear enough of that. Like gardens are ours. Um, gardens are, are black women's also. And that is just not a, a a concept that's out there very much. Um, and so I think doing that and actually providing um, or creating these spaces for black women to, to recharge and feel good is one part of it. And then a big part of it also is documenting the spaces and creating a visual narrative, um, which I believe is, is like a, it's a gift to our country and our society to have more images of black women at rest in gardens, um, which is our true birthright and is our true history um, and which um, I think we all just need to get more comfortable with seeing and knowing. And so um, I hope to contribute to that through the Black Sanctuary Gardens project um, and invite you all to support. Um, we're creating, we did one, one garden in 2018, one in 2019, one in 2020. We have three lined up for 2021 and um, we'll continue doing them um, with funds. Um, my business, every project that we install we charge a, um, an equity t uh, markup. So all of our standard um, projects have an equity markup uh, line item. So we collect funds from all of our clients um, to support Black Sanctuary Gardens. I donate my time um, and, and a lot of uh, resources from my business. Um, and then uh, you can support by donating money. And the more money we have, the more gardens we can create. And I think the more we can transform <clears throat> the story of what the American landscape is and who belongs in it. Yeah, what gardeners look like and who gardeners are for and who who make them and love them and, and it's it's everybody. Yeah. And um, so we will put a link in the chat to, uh, and of course, one of the reasons we do all of this, right? The main reason is this yeah. just like heart of joy and, <clears throat> and connection that we all find in these spaces and that we want for all of our children. Um, and that, that yeah. meaning in that sanctuary. So um, I, I think that, the transformation comes from the joy. And I, yeah. I think it's really yeah. important to stay centered on that as we, <clears throat> as we all work to make, move forward and make change is to hold on to that joy. Um, yeah. And we can find it in the garden. Yeah. We will put into the chat the, uh, the, direct link to donate to Black Sanctuary Gardens. And I, uh, I believe it will also be on the final screen and you can find it in the notes. And with that, let's move over to the Q&A. Thank you to everybody for your, uh, for your questions. And thank you uh, for your patience with me going a little bit long. I just felt like it was really important to get to um, some of of where we were. So uh, with that, I'm gonna start in on the Q&A. And again, I'll remind you, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. And if you see a question that you like and is what you wanted to ask as well, like it, and that will get it uh, put to the top of the Q&A for me to find quite quickly. So Leslie, this is from Mindy. And Mindy says, would you consider, or who would you consider your counterparts in the Northeast? Professionals to advise on plant materials for the Northeast climate zone and soils. Uh, great question. I don't, I sort of exist in um, a little bit of like a, 
a working mom silo. <laughs> um, so I'm not totally, <laughs> but um, the names that come to mind really quickly are Amber Tan in New York. Mm-hmm. Now these mm-hmm. people are not doing landscape design, but they are um, people who are centering black women in with gardens and plants and highlighting yeah. our relationships. Uh, Wambui, uh, I don't know her last name, but Ipolito. I know her. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Uh, um, Audra Lee, um, Conquer the Soil. Um, yeah, we can share some of those maybe tomorrow in an email. But um, yeah, there's um, there's a lot of us out there. There are a lot of us out there. And I think that's one of the great things that came out of 2020 is um, just a little more exposure. Um, but we, uh, we Black people and Black women have been out here gardening and being with plants and having relationships for eons, centuries, many years. And uh, we're out here. And um, if you look, you will find us. Well, and I would again come back to what you and I were talking about earlier, which is, you know, social media can be the bane of all of our existence. We recognize that, but it's also an amazing place to connect. So if you follow uh, Pine House Edible Gardens or Leslie Bennett on Instagram, and then you start following who she follows or who's talking with her, you know, you will start to create this network um, of people doing this work. And also um, Cultivating Place has, has done a lot of, I really um, love that your show has expanded and covered so many um, people of color and Black women especially. Um, so just look at those archives and there's, I listen to yeah. them, they're awesome. Thank you. Um, So this is from Brenda uh, and she asks, please talk more about the whiteness and the economic disparities in the landscape world. I know this is a short session, but this is something that people need to understand. It speaks to the way I feel when I see these grand estates that are not within my history and the expectations my my black clients have Uh, versus my white clients. You are doing such a service to the gardening world. Raise some more Mm -hmm. consciousness, she says. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's a big question. I think the biggest thing, so a short, a small answer to a big question, I think would just say for me, a lot of this comes down to um, land justice and land access. I think the history of this country is one, uh, I think whiteness in this country is um, what has enabled, and that that is, to be really clear, that is whiteness, the system and the concept, not white people specifically, although many white people do embody this whiteness. Um, But whiteness, the problematic system, has enabled enabled theft and exploitation um, from indigenous, black, and many groups of people of color. Um, And a lot of that has looked like taking land away from those people. Um, And so there's an actual uh, lack of land ownership that is, I think, at the very basis of um, what gardens look like. Um, You can absolutely garden and grow as a renter. It is really difficult. Um, And that's a big, um, that that shouldn't be understated. So um, anyway, I think that's that's what it is. It's a history of of land theft that needs to be named um, and, and corrected. So I would recommend to anybody listening that if you're not already familiar with Leah Penniman's work in Soul Fire Farm um, oh, yeah, and absolutely. some of the, the land justice work, uh, there is she is just doing phenomenal work that you can also support there. Again, not quite the same as Leslie's, but on a very same plane uh, or yeah, very she's similar. She's very much my personal hero. She is. Yeah, she is. Yeah. And uh, her network of um, land reparation and, uh, you know, Black or indigenous people of color, all BIPOC uh, support for land access and land ownership is phenomenal. But I would also say um, that the land theft is absolutely like first row of the foundation of how this all uh, has precipitated to now. But I also think there's this been this just um, visual misrepresentation uh, that at, with the rise after World War II of you know leisure classes and leisure time and magazines and marketing and HGTV kinds of the, the a visual representation of what gardens look like were all aimed at a profit model. <laughs> and so they just kept narrowing and narrowing and constricting and constricting what gardeners look like in this public representation way, which has never been true. Like mm-hmm. everybody gardens and they all right. do it and differently. The global, the global majority of people right. who are gardening are brown and black people. Yeah. So, you know, if you were to say, what does a gardener look like? It most likely looks like a brown or black person 
who's not in like a land, you know, in an estate in a suburb of America. Um, but that's just, it's not what we see. And so it's sort of reconfiguring um, that visual narrative to be more, um, not even like inclusive, just accurate. Just representative, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. And I think we are, we like this year of, of it, it has been happening for some time that the work has been coming, but this year really we had this trophic cascade of, of better representation and hopefully that just continues. I'm gonna take, it is it is 1201, I'm gonna take one more question and um, then we will, uh, we will go from there. So um, let me see. I'm wondering how the neighbors of the cul-de-sac garden have responded to how different your project is from their gardens. Has there been any interest in doing more sustainable regenerative work in that community? Um, I think that garden is well loved. Um, there's a little greenway pathway and everybody passes by. I, I, when I'm there, I get tons of positive feedback. Yeah. I have seen two gardens down that street do sort of, uh, I won't call them copies, but you know, there, there are some, some references, uh, some friendly references. Right. Um, so no, I think it's a positive, um, you know, and there's the reality that it, um, you know, it takes resources to, to make a garden like that. And so I think, um, I think, I think we're seeing that it's, it's warmly accepted. And certainly if my, if my own neighborhood is any representation, which is a suburban, you know, development kind of, um, if there were three non lawn front gardens, one of mine, one being mine and one other, five years ago, this year, there are closer to seven out of the 20. Yeah. And so we are seeing this progress and the more we see it, I think the more we will continue to see it. Yeah, um, we're definitely I, seeing that change. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for being with me today, Leslie, and, and sharing your work. Um, you, are, you are raising the bar for all of us and I'm grateful. I'm just going yeah. to step in. I'm Barbara Corcoran to say thank you both uh, agree. Thank you, Leslie, for sharing these spaces of transformation to create joy for the gardens of family memories and identity. Someone noted already, you're doing such great service to the gardening world. Thank you for that, for spreading more consciousness and much appreciation to you, Jennifer, um, for guiding the conversation, <laughs> asking such great questions and keeping track of time. Always difficult. Um, thank you to our attentive audience. You have been sending in so many questions, we cannot respond to them all, but Leslie said she would. She would take the time to go over them, through them this afternoon, and we'll answer a few, which we will share with you in the subsequent email. So lastly, a month from today, March 25th, please join us for our last conversation in the series with Larry Wiener on music, composition, and art design. Again, thanks to all, um, and uh, stay safe and stay well. Thank you all so much. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>